the thing for free. I'll tell you in a minute where you can find it. And it's basically nutritional interventions to improve your immunity. You can find that here in this page. Just Google Francisco Ramirez ResearchGate, and you should be able to download that guide for free. Just go ahead and, and uh, look for it. And you can uh, download it, share it with uh, whoever you, you want. Uh, Amen was also involved in this uh, project as we were writing these things. And um, your handout for today is going to be this uh, book, Pandemic Busters. You know, we're going to be dealing with a little bit on the topic of, of it. For those of you that don't know this book, this book is like an infographic, the whole book. In fact, the book has just been translated into Japanese, you know, so <laughs> God willing, I will be going there uh, uh, soon there to promote it. The publishing house of uh, Japan is going to be printing this, this book. The book has been translated into 16 languages as we speak. In fact, if you're interested in getting some of those uh, copies, just uh, I'll tell you uh, uh, where to find them in a minute. We also made a workbook for those people that want to study and apply these interventions in a practical way, as well as we have a few books for children. This is one of them. It's called I Have the Flu, What Should I Do? And it talks about this uh, little girl that has the flu and uh, all the things that she needs to be doing, you know, resting enough, drinking enough water, avoiding sugar, and so forth. So the book is also available in Amazon. It's available on audiobook also. If you want to listen to the book, you find it on Audible, as well as the Kindle version of the book. And for those of you that like to teach others, the whole book, we made it into PowerPoint slides. So you guys can actually get those PowerPoints, a set of 22 uh, uh, slide sets. Uh, so as you saw, you know, the, the images are really good quality, excellent material to teach others about healthy living. So if you want to download a few of the chapters for free, uh, just go to this website, healthwise.store, and then once you get to that website, select um, free downloads, and you should be able to download them for free. So the question that we're going to try to answer tonight is today is, is there any pandemic in, on the horizon, you know, or are we done? Many people ask, doctor, how come they don't stop this, you know, uh, pandemics and COVID-19 and so forth? Well, to try to stop those things is like uh, trying to stop this fish. It's really easy. Look at that. Very, very easy. <laughs> You cannot. <laughs> the question is, are you going to be ready when you face it? You know, how is your lifestyle, your way of living, are you going to be prepared when you face the next one? And um, it's interesting to me that when Jesus was asked, you know, Lord, what are there going to be some of the signs as things, you know, start getting close to a climax? Jesus gave a series of characteristics of what we would expect to see. And these are some of those signs. Matthew 24, verse 7, it says, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Anybody has heard of any wars around? Yes or no? Plenty of them, isn't it? The, the Ukrainian one is a famous one, but I'm telling you there is conflicts and pre-conflicts in multiple places around the world. Another one of the characteristics that we were going to find, it says there, there was going to be what? Famines. Is there famines today? Sadly, yes. We live in a world in which some have overabundance, but some other ones don't have enough. And uh, this is uh, from the UN, uh, in which they are identifying 20 worrisome hunger spots around the earth. 
places in which people don't have enough to eat. I actually had the privilege of visiting a few of these in my travels. And as you can see, it's not just one spot, but it's multiple locations throughout the planet where you find these hunger spots. Very, very sad situation. Another characteristic is that there was going to be earthquakes in many places. Is there many earthquakes today? Well, let me put it in, in numeric value. See, if you check the databases from 1900 to 1910, there were three earthquakes 6.0 and above. When the earthquake is 6.0 is when you really feel the earthquake. Okay? Now, compare from 1990 to the year 2000, there were 943 earthquakes, 6.0 and above. Little difference? Humongous the difference that we're seeing. In fact, if you study this chapter 24, the language of this chapter is as a female that is about to give birth. If you have ever witnessed that, you will see that those contractions start to become, you know, more powerful and more closely together, if any of you have ever experienced that. And I'm telling you, that baby is coming out with the doctor, without the doctor, or in spite of the doctor. You know, <laughs> that baby is coming out. <laughs> and that is exactly what we are seeing in this world. We can see these signs and they're becoming more frequent and more powerful, telling us that something is about to happen. And another characteristic that is there in Matthew 24 is that there's going to be what? Pestilences. Anybody heard of any pestilences around in this planet? <laughs> It was one that literally froze this planet, isn't it? And put it on a pause around the earth. There are in the world today many who close their eyes to the evidences that Christ has given to warn men of his coming. They seek to quiet all apprehension while at the same time the signs of the end, what? Are rapidly fulfilling. And you know, one of the threats that we face as humanity, as we're going to learn today, is something by the name of emerging infectious diseases. We can classify these emerging infectious diseases in two big groups. Group number one are diseases that are completely new. We had never, ever heard about them, and boom, suddenly they appear. An example of this would be the famous COVID-19. The reason why it has the 19 there is because they found it in 2019. Now, the second group is diseases that we have known about them. We even know the treatment of them but somehow they're making a resurgence, okay? An example of this would be tuberculosis. We have the medication to treat tuberculosis, yet there is a resurgence in the number of cases of tuberculosis. So let me give you an example of one of these emerging infectious diseases. Let's go back to 1981. 1981 is when we had Ronald Reagan as the president at the White House. So in your head, you know, you know where this was. In 1981, the CDC puts out this report called the MMWR. You can subscribe to that. It is free. You'll get it on your email. And they just tell you, you know, the health situation of the things happening, not only in America, but worldwide. 1981, June 5th, 1981, the CDC reports that there is a small group of homosexual males that had a very strange type of pneumonia, a 
if you're in the clinical practice, you see pneumonia on a regular basis. But this pneumonia was not the average pneumonia that you find as a clinician. And did you know that this is the very first time that in a scientific document, they reported something that later became the AIDS epidemic? This is the very first time that we had ever heard of AIDS. And from that small group, now more than 36 million people worldwide have lost their lives as a result of this AIDS epidemic. And I'm telling you, there's many new diseases. This is not just one here and there. From mad cow's disease, to West Nile virus, to Lyme disease, to Ebola, to HIV, and the list keeps going and going and going of these emerging infectious diseases. One of the tools that we have to try to study and identify the sources of many of these diseases is something by the name of medical anthropology. I can trace back and try to find origin of multiple diseases. Let's give an example. Smallpox. We know that smallpox came from camel pox, which came from humans with having close contact with camels, that virus mutated and then jumped into humans, and then humans started infecting themselves. You don't hear very much about this disease nowadays due to the vaccination efforts that they were able to be extremely successful. Another one is whooping cough, also known as pertussis. This one came from pigs. This is one of the many ones that came from pigs. In fact, in, there's a reason why in the Bible it says, don't eat pig, don't even touch it. And I'm telling you, even here in, uh, in this side of the world, Pigs have caused all kinds of troubles. For example, when the um, Spanish and Portuguese came to these islands for the first time, they brought with them multiple diseases that almost got the Chamorro people to get extinct by the 100%. It's a God's mercy that they were not extinct. So, as they started coming in, you know, the Chamorro people, first, uh, it is, uh, um, one of the theories is that they came from the Philippines. That's uh, the theory that they came through genetics, fry pottery, and different studies. That's uh, the current theory where they came from, these people. Then once they were here, when the Spanish and Portuguese came, they started bringing multiple diseases to these islands and check the statistics. The people here, 93% of the population was wiped out by the diseases that the Europeans brought to these islands. Now, it's a very interesting phenomenon that the disease was flowing from the Europeans to the people from here and not the other way around. Same thing happened also in the Americas. See, when Christopher Columbus came for the first time to the Americas, he went back. And the second trip, he brought a small group of pigs. And that caused, in the continent of America, a swine flu that wiped out millions of people in the American continent. It would have been better off, you know, to leave those pigs up in Europe. In fact, Europeans brought to here and the American continent the pigs, the cows, the chickens, the lambs, 
the goats, the horses, none of these animals were here. Even those deer that are around there, the Europeans also brought that. Even those rats that are eating your food there at night, the Europeans brought those animals also here. They were not here, none of those animals. In fact, if you study a little bit the history of Mexico, a few years later after Christopher Columbus' arrival, Hernán Cortés came to conquer Mexico. Already half of the population of Mexico had been devastated by the diseases that the Europeans brought to that continent. In fact, that's one of the reasons why small groups of army were able to take down tremendous empires that were very powerful because their armies had been devastated by these diseases. In fact, by 1618, the population of the Indians of the, um, Mexico had been come down, the Aztecs, from 18 million to 1.6 million. Tremendous devastation that these diseases were causing. And why was this phenomena? We'll answer that in a minute. Another source of disease has been typhoid, and this one came on chickens. In fact, all chickens in their digestive tract, you find this germ. Now, before, there was no chickens here. Therefore, there was no typhoid fever. So this is also an introduced disease. And then measles, something that, again, has been very well controlled due to vaccination. This one came from close contact of humans with sheep and cows. Just the last 200 years, it had already killed 200 million people. Again, you don't see these numbers due to vaccination has been able to control many of these numbers. And dogs actually gave us the influenza, that disease that comes, you know, in a cyclical basis, usually on the winters. Now, think a little bit about it. You think that the dogs that are flying there in the sky are the ones that infected us? No, they're too far. I needed to have the duck here on my face <laughs> so the duck could cough or sneeze, then it could infect me. I had to domesticate the duck in order for that process to take place. And leprosy came from the water buffalo. If you go to Asia, in countries like, you know, uh, Thailand, Philippines, and so forth, lots of these animals are there. Close contact of humans with that animal, that's what caused that disease to jump into humans. In this excellent book, I have it at home, Guns, Germs, and Steel, Jared Diamond explains how these diseases of the Europeans wiped out 95% of the natives in many countries due to that flow of disease that was happening from the Europeans to the Native Americans. And why did the Native American and Native uh, WAM uh, diseases didn't affect the Europeans? Because there was no plagues here. And the reason why is because these people here and the people from the Americans, and this is the, the key word, didn't do animal husbandry. See, I'm not saying they were vegetarian. For example, up in the American continent, sometimes they will go and, and hunt some bison. Well, they will kill a bison, but they will let the rest of the bison run free. While in Europe, they had animals that they put in an enclosed space, and humans had close contact with them, and therefore it was easy for the diseases of those animals to jump onto those people that were caring for them. In fact, in chapter 11 of the book, with great detail, Jared Diamond explains how that process of disease happened due to that close contact with animals. And 
If you check the history of Europe, you're going to see how Europeans were being hit by diseases and tremendous plagues on a cyclical basis. They were being hit by these diseases. Let me show you some numbers. The plague of Justinian killing 10,000 people a day. The Black Death killing half of the Europeans. The Italian plague wiping out one third of the people of Venetia. The plague of London killing 8,000 people a week. The plague of Marcel, 100,000 people dying. And on a cyclical basis, they would be getting hit over and over by these plagues. And you can trace every single one of those plagues to animals. Now, the story started changing by the time that we reached the 20th century with the advent of things like public health interventions in which they started teaching people the importance of washing your hands and taking showers, you know, that started decreasing a lot of many of those commonly infectious diseases. The advent of antibiotics before we, you know, didn't have many options if somebody had an infectious disease by bacteria. Now with antibiotics, we could stop them. And then vaccinations did a good job to decrease many of the common killers of the, the, uh, of the world. And something happened around the 1950s 1960s, infectious diseases started to decrease dramatically worldwide, but around the 1950s and 1960s, a resurgence in the number of infectious diseases started increasing dramatically. And it's interesting that uh, um, this has to do with something that I learned when I moved to Norway. I speak Norwegian because I used to live in Norway. And you know, when I moved to Norway in my 20s, I realized that Norway was very different from Mexico. Not only the weather is different, you know, <laughs> it's quite different there, the weather, but the whole country runs very differently from Mexico. You know, the level of honesty, uh, you know, the low levels of corruption, uh, the, the, the way that wealth is distributed very equally among all the population and so forth. So when I got there, I started thinking myself, you know, I'm going to find out why Norwegians are such prosperous people. And what I did, I went to the local library to read the history of Norway. And I got shocked. Norway in the past was identical to Mexico. There was corruption, there was abuse of power, there was dysfunctionality. It was a mess, Norway. But somebody by the name of Martin Luther came to Norway and it gave them a new philosophy and that created tremendous changes in the behavior of the people of Norway. You know, I've been to 88 countries on planet Earth, and I've seen this with my own eyes. You show me a Protestant-built country, I'm going to show you the most prosperous countries on planet Earth. Let's go and see around the world. You have Canada and America. You have England, Iceland. You have Norway, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, Germany, Switzerland, Holland. These are the countries that people risk their lives to try to migrate to. And then to the influence of the English, you have Singapore, tremendously prosperous place. If for those of you that ever have visited there. And you know, Singapore is in the same peninsula as Malaysia. And you cross from Singapore to Malaysia, man, it's just a totally different world there, you know? And then you have Hong Kong, tremendously prosperous place. Sadly, now it passed into the hands of the Chinese, and that place is going downhill before our own eyes. And then you have also South Korea, 
the country with the highest amount of Protestants in all Asia. And then you have Australia and New Zealand, tremendously prosperous countries as a result of a change of philosophy. But something happened in these countries. Something happened, very sadly, that is described here in Proverbs 38. Don't let me tell lies and don't make me what? Too rich or too poor. Give me only enough food for each day. If I have too much, what's going to happen? I might deny that I need you. And sadly, this is what happened in many of those countries. People forgot the source of their prosperity and agnosticism, atheism, postmodernism, and these types of philosophies now dominate these countries. And especially the young people, many of them stating that they no longer have any religious beliefs. And sadly, the reality is that this is having consequences. Book, Great Controversy. If you haven't read that book, I suggest you pick up a copy. Excellent book. I'm, I'm reading from book, Great, Great Controversy. Satan works through the elements also to garner his harvest of unprepared souls. He has studied the secrets of the laboratories of nature, and he uses all his power to control the elements as far as God allows. It is God that chills his creatures and hatches them in from the power of the destroyer. But the Christian world has shown contempt for the law of Jehovah, and the Lord will do just what He has declared that He would. He will withdraw His blessings from the earth and remove His protecting care from those who are rebelling against His law and teaching and forcing others to do the same. Satan has control of all whom God does not specially guard. He will bring disease and disaster, and their populous cities are reduced to ruin and desolation. Even now He's at work. In accidents and calamities by sea and by land, in great conflagrations, in fierce tornadoes and terrific hailstorms, in tempests, floods, cyclones, tidal waves, and earthquakes, in every place and in thousand force, forms, Satan is exercising his power. He imparts to the air a deadly taint, and what happens? Thousands perish by the pestilence. These visitations are to become more and more frequent and disastrous. Destruction will be upon both men and beasts. The earth mourning and faded away. The haughty people do languish. The earth also is defiled and the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, and broken the everlasting covenant. So this is a sad reality. Those countries that were tremendously blessed now that they turn their backs, you show me the most secular countries on earth, I'm going to show you the highest suicidal rates in the world. But when I go to places like Australia and New Zealand, beautiful countries, prosperous places, and so forth, with jobs and education and health care and so forth, yet young people taking their lives because of the emptiness of these philosophies that are causing in their lives. So this is what is called the rose effect. And let me show you how society has changed very much. Notice that it's around the 1950s, 1960s when this change took place. For example, percentage of teenage girls who had premarital sexual relationships. Notice that the change started here in the 1950s, 1960s, and then the numbers started going up. Sexually transmitted diseases among young people, 10 to 14 diseases, gonorrhea specifically. I mean, this disease shouldn't be at this age, yes or no? Notice how here, around 1560s, the numbers started climbing up. Birth rates of single girls that are 10 to 14 years old. Notice here, the numbers start here and then start going up. Out of wedlock birds as percentage of all birds, notice how has been steadily climbing up and up and up. Divorces going up. Child abuse, 2,300% more today. Illegal drug use, six 
thousand percent more today than 1950s, 1960s. Violent crimes, one thousand percent more today. Suicide among teens going up. So by the time that we reached 1975, we had 30 new diseases that nobody had ever heard about them. New emerging infectious diseases. And here's a nice map of these emerging infectious diseases. Please notice it's not just one here and there. They are all over the place, and this is something very worrisome. Even the World Health Organization is very worried about this trend that is happening worldwide. Page 17 of this book that I have at home, depending on the present policies and action, this situation would lead to a catastrophic storm of microbial threats. So by 1975, we had many, many new diseases. Let me give you a few examples of where these diseases are coming from. Argentina, classic example. Argentina, as a national policy, what they started doing, they started cutting down their forests and putting instead animals because many more people wanted meat. So in order to provide that meat worldwide, they cut their forests and put these animals there. As a result of that, there was close contact of diseases that were naturally in the forest with the animals that they brought there and the people that were taking care of those animals. So here's a map. Do you see all these countries here? All those countries started following the same pattern as Argentina, and every single one of these are emerging infectious diseases that surged just recently as a result of those new countrywide policies. Here's another example. There is these new, very worrisome diseases. N notice the title of these diseases. These diseases are called the viral hemorrhagic fevers. Do they sound nice? Just a just name. <laughs> no, they are not nice diseases. The most famous one of these happens to be Ebola. That's the most famous one that everybody knows. But there's other ones that are really nasty. For example, this Marburg disease. I, this Marburg disease, notice, it has a fatality of 50%. 50% of the people that catch this bug are going to die. It is a nasty disease. Where did they come from? Let me tell you the story. Business people realized that Africa had really good quality wood. So what they did, they started sending crews of workers inside deep in the forest to cut down and harvest those trees. Now, Imagine that you're one of those workers, and you're going to go there to that forest for the next, you know, couple of months. What are you going to eat? I mean, after, you know, a week or so, you're going to run out of your food that you brought with you. There's no ladies there, you know, trying to sell you some food. There's no corn plantations. You could go and cut, you know, some ears of corn and, and boil it. What are you going to eat? Well, these people started killing monkeys and started eating this meat. In fact, it has been very well documented, 26 different species of monkeys that these people have been killing. And the worst part is that they went and told the people of the city, hey, you should try chimpanzee, it tastes really good. And now the people from the city started eating these things. Again, from what we read, you know, in Leviticus 11, it says, don't eat these animals, yes or no? And here they are disobeying that principle. It gets worse. See, Ebola can be traced to eating those animals. See, these diseases were naturally in these monkeys. So as people ate these, these animals, the disease jumped into the humans. 
There's many good documentaries if you're interested in the topic. This one from Vice News, how that Ebola came from that monkey meat. This is something very well documented. In fact, did you know that AIDS came in the same way? Here is Journal Science, one of the top journals in the world. Direct exposure to animal blood and secretions as a result of hunting, bushering, and other activities, such as consumption of uncooked contaminated meat, is what caused AIDS. AIDS is in some, this HIV virus is naturally in some of these monkeys, so by eating that meat, that AIDS jump into humans. See, Again, there's a reason why Leviticus 11 says, don't eat monkey. In fact, if you're interested in the topic, here's this uh, article here from National Geographic documenting how that HIV came from that consumption of those monkeys. And this is the sad reality of our world. So the problem with this uh, AIDS is that we have not reached the top. We're seeing more and more cases, especially nearby you guys here in Southeast Asia and Southern Africa, there are many, many cases of this AIDS. Another problem is your close by neighbors here in Asia by doing these wet markets. Just think about it. You have different species of animals that you're putting them together, animals that in nature they were never together. So that makes very easy for these diseases to mutate and become extremely pathogenic. So this, uh, let's go and, and visit one of these places so yeah, you can see with your own eyes. This is not a problem just on China, it's multiple countries. These are bats. So what they do, they cut the wings, they do some recipes with the wings, and they do some recipes with the rest of the bats. Question, this, does Leviticus 11 says you should eat bat? No, he said that you should not be eating bat according to the Bible. And then just next door, there's this guy chopping off this, uh, you know, boa type of snake that they're going to eat. Again, the Bible says don't eat that animal. Did you know that bats have little hands? They are at the end of the wing. Look at that, the little hands of the bats. And then you go to the next table, look at what these people are going to eat. They have these rats they're going to eat. Does the Bible say you should eat rat? No, the Bible said you should not be eating rat. And then just next to it, you have this poor cat, you know, that they're going to eat. And the Bible says don't eat cat. Pig, the Bible says don't eat pig. And then even more bats. And then as we walk outside, you can see they have the poor dogs here that they're going to eat. The Bible says don't eat dogs. And here are the next dogs they're going to kill. Look at that. Very sad. And then the cats and the cats they're going to kill, they're down there. And look at the things that they're eating. Look at this thing, you know. It's not like, mm, man, that looks so yummy. Man, I want to eat that stuff. No, it's, <laughs> it's not even something that looks attractive. Does the Bible say you should be eating those, you know, lizard type of creatures? No, the Bible is clear. You should not be eating those things. So by violating those principles, we get ourselves in really big trouble. Now, you may say, well, doctor, here in, uh, you know, in, in America, we don't have those wet markets. I'm very glad you guys don't have those wet markets. But unfortunately, we have this. Did you know the next pandemic is coming from here? We know that they're very, very clear. This is the perfect place for new pandemics to emerge. Just think a little bit about it. You have these tremendous amounts of chickens. Do you think the chickens are happy here? No, this is not the way we should be treating chickens. So you're feeding them all this artificial stuff. Because there's so many, you have to medicate each one of them. There is no sunshine layer to disinfect things. There is no fresh air to bring you know, new air and, 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 and so forth. 
And because these chickens are not happy, their immune system is down, is the perfect place to mutate. In fact, if you read the news in South America, they have some beginnings of this bird flu down there that is infecting now animals from the ocean. In my book, I have a clip there from uh, Reuters on how in Japan they started with one of these uh, uh, avian flus. And the issue is that this avian flu, we have been able to stop it. But I'm telling you, one of these days, we're not going to be able to stop it. And this thing is going to cause a disaster everywhere. Another source of disease is this animal. Very close by here in Asia, they raise this animal for meat, but they also make the world's most expensive coffee. How they do that? They feed this creature coffee beans, and with the poopy, they make coffee. And they pay big bucks for this thing. It costs like $600 for half a kilo of this poopy, you know? I don't know if they ever heard of, you know, uh, <laughs> peppermint tea or something else, you know? <laughs> Why would you need to drink this thing? And supposedly, because the anal glands gave him a very special flavor, so people pay big bucks to drink this type of coffee. Did you know that this is where SARS-1 came? So. COVID-19, it's called SARS number two because there was a SARS number one. SARS number one came from this creature. This is uh, journal Lancet, a very serious uh, publication. A culinary choice in southern China, the civet cat, led to a fatal infection in Hong Kong and subsequently 8,000 cases of SARS and almost 1,000 deaths in 30 countries in six continents. Another very nasty bug that is not too far from you guys here in Malaysia is a bug by the name of Streptococcus suis. Man, this bug is nasty. It likes to go to your nervous system. Half of the people that get this disease are gonna go blind, and then it goes to the brain and it gives meningitis. Where did this bug come from? Here's the official report. The official report tell us stress due to poor housing conditions such as overcrowding and inadequate ventilation are risk factors for the development of a clinical apparent disease. And this is you know, among pigs. This came from the pigs. Because many places, they raise the pigs like this. Their whole lives, they have the pigs like this. Why are they so mean and have the pigs like this? Because if the pig does exercise, it makes muscle, and if it makes muscle, it makes the meat hard. And who wants hard meat? Everybody wants nice and soft meat. So many of the pigs are raised in these conditions. And this Nipah virus, man, this bug is nasty. This is also from Asia. This bug has a mortality between 40 to 70%. Between 40 to 70% of the people that will catch this are going to die. In fact, the authorities are afraid that some crazy person there may, you know, uh, culture this virus and then just drop it there in some city. Imagine how many people would die as a result of this virus. Where did this uh, bug came from? Here's the official report. Without these large, largely intensively managed pig farms in Malaysia, it would have been extremely difficult for the virus to emerge. And in fact, if you go to my Twitter, there was a very interesting article from the New York Times in which China is planning 10 to 15 story tall buildings to fill them up all with pigs. Imagine that. That is not a good idea at all because we can get even more nasty bugs as a result of that type of policy. But people keep on asking for pig. The business people are going to keep on doing this. 
we as consumers need to change if we want to see a change in this. And another nasty thing that is coming up is antibiotic resistance, in which, you know, we know which bug is it, but you give the medication and it doesn't work. There's people that perish in the ICU because of this. In this study that was caught, it cost more than a million dollars to do this study, what they were doing, they were uh, documenting how when people ate animals that were exposed to antibiotics, when you ate that meat, you became antibiotic resistant. And you can see it here. See, everybody that ate that meat that had been exposed to antibiotics, every single one of them had an, some level of antibiotic resistance. Compare to these people that were on a plant-based diet, notice that none of them had this antibiotic resistance. So it's even dangerous to eat this type of meat. So this is something very worrisome worldwide, this antibiotic resistance, and most of that is not to the overprescription of antibiotics, but rather the reality that 70% of all the antibiotics worldwide are given to animals. Therefore, we are creating tremendous antibiotic resistance, and the day that we need them, it doesn't work. And this is the problem that we are facing. So notice in the book, Counsels on Diet, the light given me is that it will not be very long before we should have to give up any animal fruit. Even milk will have to be discarded. Disease is accumulating rapidly. The curse of God is upon the earth because what? Who has cursed? Man has cursed it. And this is not just one isolated quotation there. There's another one here. Tell them that the time will, will soon come when there will be no safety in using eggs, milk, cream, or butter because disease in animals is increasing in proportion to the increase of the wickedness among men. Question, are men becoming more wicked today? It's the reality of the world that we live in. You know, I was at the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. In fact, that's the reason why I'm here, because that's where I met Dr. Robinson. And yeah, you know, I told him, hey, I'm coming down to, to Australia, you know, there's a possibility that I may be able to jump up to, to WAM, you know. But it was very interesting, this meeting, where you have some of the most brightest minds in the world, the whole conference with thousands of people, guess what many of them were serving there? all plant-based. See, because this is where the world is going towards. And we shouldn't be behind. We should be ahead of the curve. There is protection by following that type of lifestyle. So we need to let those animals alone, you know? There are multiple diseases that I have caused. Let's leave those animals alone. So some people say, well, doctor, this is scary. <laughs> well, yeah, it is. But let me remind you of something. There was a time that the disciples were in a tremendously fierce storm. They thought they were going to die. But what made the difference was that Jesus was on this boat. <laughs> and the story changed completely as a result of that. In my opinion, it will be a good idea for you to invite Jesus on your boat <laughs> because things are very fearful around it. And without him, where are you going to get hope to face the future and keep forward? In that way, we can claim this promise in 2 Timothy 1.7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. May God bless us. May we ask God for wisdom as we take choices for the future, and may we continue with that mission that God has for us, and ask Jesus to come in your boat, 
and he will give you the victory. Thank you very much. May God bless you.